Ladies and gentlemen, whether we recognize it or not, each and every one of us are in the midst of a war, a great controversy, a cosmic conflict, a supernatural battle between good and evil. Because when you go and study that sanctuary topic, it helps us to understand that the wicked are not going to reign forever. It dispels all fear from our lives because it shows us that God's kingdom is going to reign we place ourselves in line with the Lamb of God, His kingdom, the truth, Jesus Christ, it says that we're going to win the victory as well. Can you say amen? The sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross was a death nail to Satan's Antichrist kingdom. That as we see the superpowers of the past and the Antichrist kingdom working havoc against God and the people of God, that we do not need to be afraid.
That was beautiful, amen? Praise God. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we begin with prayer tonight. Let us pray. Thank you so much, Lord, for your everlasting love that has drawn us to this place tonight. Lord, help us to think about your love more often. Forgive us, Lord, for the times in which we have been distracted by this world. Lord, as we've come to this place, we pray that you'd remove every earthly distraction, every worldly care, and that you'd give to us an attentive mind that we may be able not only to understand the message, but that we would experience your infinite love in a fresh way tonight. Lord, this evening's presentations are heavy messages. So we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fill this room fill our hearts lead us and guide us and i pray your blessings would fall upon us we pray this prayer in jesus precious name amen, amen. our message tonight is entitled superpowers of bible prophecy this evening we're going to look at the key superpowers that god's prophetic word reveals to us you see friends history tells the story of ancient prophecies or ancient empires whose military might and political power has shaped the destiny of our world but we're gonna see from God's Word tonight that these empires were written on the pages of prophecy long before it was ever written on the pages of history testifying to the reality that God knows the future God tells the truth and we can trust his prophetic word and we're going to find more evidence tonight of why we can believe in the bible we, le we learned on a previous night that each and every one of us are in the midst of a war a supernatural battle a great controversy a conflict between the forces of good and the forces of evil it's a spiritual war that is fought in the battlefield of this world especially in the minds of individuals and as students of bible prophecy it is of utmost importance for us to understand the nature of the two principles that are contending for supremacy. The two kingdoms that are warring against each other. It's important for us to know the nature of the, uh, of the two so that we might make an intelligent decision to be on the winning side and to align ourselves with the winning kingdom. Can you say amen? amen. And so I want you to take your Bible with me and go to the book of Revelation, chapter 12, as we find the climax of the controversy described in Bible prophecy. Revelation chapter 12, beginning with verse 17, and we're going to study this chapter in detail on a later night. But this evening is another foundational message. But notice with me in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, it describes the climax between good and evil and how Satan is seeking to make war with the people of God, those who choose to follow Jesus Christ. And if you're there and if you're ready to study the Bible, would you please say amen? amen? The Bible says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make, what is that word? War. War with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here in prophetic language, we read the description of a dragon that is wroth. He is angry with the woman and seeking to make war with this woman. Well, question, who's the dragon? According to verse 9, the dragon is Satan. Notice what it says in verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we see that the dragon is none other than Satan himself. But, and, and, and as we see this dragon making war with the woman, the question is, who is this woman that Satan is so angry with? Well, friends, in Bible prophecy, a woman is, represents God's church or God's people. In fact, you can notice with me on the screen in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the what? Church. The church and gave himself for it. 
So here we find the husband-wife relationship is a symbol of the relationship that Jesus, our heavenly husband, wants to have with us, his church, the earthly bride. So we find that in Bible prophecy, a woman represents simply the church or the people of God. And you can also write down 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, as well as Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2, and many other scriptures bear this fact out very clearly that in prophecy, the woman is a symbol of the church. And so as we see the dragon, wroth with the woman, seeking to make war with her, it's a simple symbol of Satan angry at God's people. And if that makes sense, would you please say amen? amen. And so this controversy is taking place where Satan is trying to destroy the people of God. Those who choose to follow Jesus Christ excites the wrath of the dragon. Now this war that is described in Revelation 12, 17 is actually expounded upon as you follow the context when you go to chapter 13 of Revelation. And we're going to study this chapter in detail on a later night, but I want us to notice a few highlights from Revelation 13 because it describes who the dragon that is Satan is going to use to make war with God's people. Revelation chapter 13 describes the Antichrist beast kingdom. And remember, we studied before that in Bible prophecy, a beast simply represents a kingdom or a political power. And it's this Antichrist kingdom that the dragon, that is Satan, is going to use to seek to destroy the woman or the church of God. I want us to notice who's behind this Antichrist beast power. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2 that the dragon gave him, that is the beast, his power and his seat and great authority and so tell me friends who empowers this beast it is simply the dragon and who's the dragon it's satan and so satan is behind this antichrist beast kingdom and notice what he's going to empower this beast to do in verse 4 it says and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the who the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him here we find it's the dragon who is satan that empowers this antichrist beast kingdom to make war with god's people in fact it says in verse 7 and it was given unto him talking about the beast to make war with who with the saints that's the woman the church of god the people of god and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So we find that Satan, the dragon, is empowering this Antichrist beast kingdom. We're going to find out the identity of the Antichrist this coming Saturday. But it empowers this kingdom to seek to destroy the saints. That's the woman or the people of God. And not only does this beast uh, uh, attack horizontally to the woman, but he also attacks vertically to God. Notice what it says in, in verse 6. And he opened his mouth in what? blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven so we find that this antichrist beast kingdom not only um, attacks horizontally but also attacks God by his blasphemy making war with the Lord vertically by his bold blasphemy and so the question is who is this bold and blasphemous beast I want us to notice some of his characteristics in verse 2 of Revelation 13 please notice with me in your Bible the Bible tells us that the beast which I saw was like unto a what in fact let's start with verse 1 shall we Revelation 13 verse 1 it says and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten what horns, horns. and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy and the beast which I saw was like unto a what leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority and so here we find this antichrist beast system kingdom that satan empowers has specific characteristics notice on the screen with me the bible says that it had the mouth of a lion the feet of a bear it had the body of a leopard it had 10 horns and this antichrist beast kingdom speaks blasphemy against god vertically attack vertically attacking the lord but also horizontally making war with the saints as we take a look at these different characteristics we find that this beast is a composite beast it is a what kind of beast in other words, it has the same characteristics of other beasts or other kingdoms of the past. 
So who is this bold and blasphemous beast? Who is this antichrist kingdom that seeks to make war with the people of God horizontally and making war with God through blasphemy vertically? Well, friends, in order to understand who it is, we first have to go back to the Old Testament. Because we learned before that the book of Revelation is built upon the solid foundation of the what? The Old Testament scriptures. And friends, Daniel the prophet in the Old Testament, he saw the same symbols in prophetic vision. And so now we go back to the book of Daniel, the seventh chapter. In order to understand Revelation, we first must understand the companion book of Daniel. And so now turn with me to Daniel chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. That's on page 887, if you're using the Seminar Bible. We're going to the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, and we're going to remain in the book of Daniel for the rest of this presentation this evening. Daniel chapter 7, beginning with verse 1, page 887. And when you get there, would you let me know by saying amen? amen. Daniel chapter 7, beginning with verse 1, page 887. We find Daniel the prophet saw the same symbols that John the Revelator saw in describing the composite beast kingdom. Notice with me, Daniel 7, verse 1, the Bible says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Verse 2, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great what? Sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse or different one from another. Here we find the prophet Daniel. During the time of the reign of Babylon, he has a prophetic vision. And in his vision, he sees a windy seascape, the wind that is blowing upon the waters. And as, the, as, as he looks upon the, 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 the surface of the ocean, he sees four beasts, four animals, rise up from the ocean, from the waters, different from one another. What exactly does this mean? Well, oh, friends, I'm so thankful that we don't have to guess because the Bible is its own interpreter. Can you say amen? I want us to notice what these symbols represent, and I hope you write them down very quickly. For the sake of time, I'm going to let you look it up when you get home. But please write it down. What does the sea or the waters represent in Bible prophecy? According to Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15, the sea is a symbol of multitudes of people that speak multitudes of different languages. Now, the wind in prophecy is a symbol of war, strife, destruction, desolation, according to Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 27. And then beasts in Bible prophecy, as we mentioned, simply represent kings and their kingdoms. And you can find that in the book of Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 and verse 23. In fact, let's read it since we're right there. Notice Daniel 7, 17. The Bible says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. And then jumping down to verse 23. Thus he saith, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. And so we find that in prophecy, a beast is a symbol of a king and its kingdom. And we do the same thing today, don't we? We liken nations to that of animals. What is the beast or the animal that is a symbol of the United States of America? the bald eagle right and so this is what God is doing in this passage he's likening nations to that of beasts and so as Daniel sees this windy seascape and then four beasts rise up what it simply means is that there's a multitude of people that are warring against each other and out of the wars rise up four empires of prophecy these are the superpowers that would reign from Daniel's day to the last days and friends God is the greatest teacher can he say amen and one of the greatest methods of teaching is to repeat or review and enlarge or to give more details. And as you study Bible prophecy, you find God as the greatest teacher in the universe using this very important principle of teaching. He reveals something and then later on he repeats the same thing, but then he gives more details enlarging upon it. It's called the repeat and enlarge principle. What is the principle called? Repeat and enlarge. And so these four beasts that we're going to look at this evening, these four kingdoms, God is simply repeating and enlarging on what he's already revealed in the second chapter of the book of Daniel. Remember we studied last night about the strange man made of different metals. How many metals were there specifically? Four metals, and each metal would represent a different 
kingdom. And these four medals on the image of Daniel chapter 2 are parallel with the four beasts that is described in Daniel chapter 7. God is simply repeating the same kingdoms and he's enlarging upon it, giving more details because God is the greatest teacher. And let's see if you can remember what the four kingdoms were without looking on the screen. The head of gold represented the kingdom of Babylon. The chest and arms of silver represents Medo-Persia. The belly and thighs of brass represents Greece, long legs of iron is Rome, and then the feet with the ten toes, part of iron and clay, represent divided Rome or divided Europe. And these four beasts represent the same thing, but let's go through them together as we continue our study tonight. We're going now, Daniel chapter 7, and by the way, these four kingdoms, the lion, bear, leopard, and the terrible looking beast with ten horns, set the foundational characteristics for the last antichrist superpower that we read about in Revelation 13. Remember the beast in Revelation 13 that the dragon empowered to make war with the saints? It had the mouth of a lion, the feet of a bear, body of a leopard, and had 10 horns. Well, friends, these four beasts that we're gonna look at in Daniel chapter seven laid the foundational characteristics for this end time superpower. And so in order for us to understand the characteristics of that final superpower, the Antichrist beast kingdom in the last days, we first have to understand these foundational beasts to have a correct understanding. Are you with me, yes or no? So now let's go through them together, shall we? The first beast was like a lion that had eagle's wings. Let's read it now in verse 4. The Bible says, The first was like a lion, and it had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon the feet of the man, and a man's heart was given to it. This lion with eagle wi eagle's wings that is standing upon its feet is parallel with the head of gold of the image of Daniel chapter 2 representing the golden kingdom of Babylon. In fact, the Bible even tells us in Jeremiah chapter 50 verses 43 and 44 that Babylon was likened unto a lion. Notice what it says. Jeremiah 50 verse 43 and 44. It says that the king of Babylon shall come up as a, as a lion. And so this Lion with eagle's wings represents the first kingdom in our study tonight, the Babylonian Empire. This was the empire that was ruling during Daniel's time. And the Bible says that this lion has two wings upon its back. Now, what do wings represent in Bible prophecy? We don't have to guess because the Bible explains itself. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, wings in Bible prophecy represent speed and conquest. And so this lion has two wings. It was a symbol of the, the spirit of conquest and the speed that the Babylonians had in conquering the entire then known world during this time period. And that's why it has two wings on the back of it. And in fact, I want you to notice what it says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 50 and verse 17. The Bible tells us that Israel is a, sh is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. Who had driven Israel away? The lions. This Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. So we find that Babylon is likened unto a lion, and it was this kingdom that, that wrought havoc against the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel. They, if you remember, this is a description when the Babylonians came, and they destroyed Jerusalem. They destroyed the walls and the streets and the holy sanctuary, and they slew many of the Hebrews and took many of them as slaves in captivity. And that's why you find Daniel, as he's writing this prophecy, he's in Babylon. The Israelites have been enslaved and brought into captivity by the lion. The lion had scattered the sheep, the Israelite nation. In fact, I was in Germany a few years ago, and I got the chance to do some meetings there in the city of Berlin. And in the city of Berlin, there is a museum called the Pergamum Museum. You might have heard of it. And in the Pergamum Museum, the, there were some German archaeologists that actually excavated some of the ancient walls of the kingdom of Babylon that we're studying in the Bible today. And they brought them into the museum there in, in, in Berlin. And would you, like, would, would you like to guess, friends, that on the walls of Babylon are pictures of lions with eagle's wings? It was amazing. I was there. I saw it with my own eyes on the walls of Babylon, lions with eagle's wings, because this was a fit description of this kingdom, the Babylonian Empire. Now, friends, if that, is, is that, if that makes sense, would you please say amen? Yes. But here's the question now. What was one of the main principal characteristics of Babylon? In other words, what was Babylon known by? What was the lion like? I want you to notice the attitude of King Nebuchadnezzar, the lion kingdom. In Daniel chapter 4 and verse 30, 
the king spoke and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Here we find the attitude of the king and the attitude of the Babylonians was that they were very proud. Isn't that right? This is my kingdom. I did this. Me, my, I, I. Babylon, brothers and sisters, was known for, for being a very proud and a very, and a very rich kingdom. And so when we read in Revelation 13 that the Antichrist beast has the mouth of a lion, it's because they demonstrate the same pride and the same riches that Babylon displayed. The composite beast, the Antichrist, displays the pride and the riches of Babylon. It is a very proud kingdom that it's known for having lots of wealth. But the Bible tells us that pride goes before a fall. And that's the reason why this kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, did not last forever. Daniel saw that this lion, who had two wings, it said that the wings were plucked from the lion. Now, if the wings represent speed and conquest, the plucking of the wings simply represent that its power, the spirit of conquest that it once had, would be stripped from it as it would be overcome by another beast power or another kingdom. History tells us that the Babylonian Empire ruled from 605 to 539 BC. And then Daniel saw another beast rise up out of the sea after that. Let's take a look at the second beast now in verse 5. The Bible tells us that this second beast was like a bear. Notice what it says. Daniel 7 in verse 5. I beheld another beast, a second like unto a bear. And it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, and devour much flesh. Here we find, brothers and sisters, that this bear raised up on one side is of the parallel kingdom to the chest and arms of silver in the image of Daniel chapter 2, representing the kingdom that would follow the Babylonian kingdom, which is none other than the Medo-Persian Empire. And in the prophecy, Daniel saw the bear raised up on one side symbolizing an imbalance of power and the reason why is because there had there was two kingdoms that had to unite together in order to overcome babylon the medes and the persians were two separate kingdoms that united and amongst the two the persians were stronger than the medes and that is symbolized as the bear raised up on one side an imbalance of power but what about the three ribs in the mouth between the teeth of it what do those three ribs represent it represents the three other kingdoms that the Medo-Persian Empire had to overcome in order to be the world superpower of the day. History tells us that the Medes and Persians not only had to destroy Babylon, but also Lydia to the north and Egypt in the south. And these three kingdoms are symbolized by the three ribs in the mouth of it. And once the Medo-Persians conquered those three kingdoms, then they became the world superpower of that day. But what was the principal characteristic of the Medo-Persian Empire? You remember in the book of Esther, the Persians were reigning during this time period. And you remember in Esther chapter 3 and verse 13, there was a man whose name was Haman that influenced the king of Persia to pass a law to persecute or to eradicate the people of God. Do you remember that story? Haman influenced the king, and the king passed the law that could not be changed. It could not be revoked. It was a persecuting law. This is one of the principal characteristics of the Persian Empire, passing laws to persecute the people of God. And friends, in the Revelation 13, this composite Antichrist beast, it has the feet of a bear because it demonstrates that same characteristic. Here is the Antichrist kingdom that will pass laws to persecute the people of God making war with the woman and trying to destroy the saints of God. And friends, if that makes sense, would you please say amen? amen. And friends, history tells us that the chest and arms of silver, the bear raised up on one side with three ribs in the mouth of it, the Medo-Persian Empire reigned from 539 to 331 B.C. Then after that, Daniel saw a third beast rise up out of the sea. Let's read it now. This beast is like a leopard. Notice what it says in verse 6. The Bible says, after this, I beheld, and lo, another, like a what? A leopard, which had on the back of it how many wings? Four wings of a fowl. The beast also had how many heads? Four heads, and dominion was given unto it. 
So we find that this third beast, which is a leopard with four heads and four wings, it's parallel with the belly and thighs of brass on the image of Daniel chapter 2, representing the third kingdom following the Persian Empire, which is none other than the which empire? The Grecian Empire under the rulership of Alexander the Great. And friends, this beast, the leopard, is a, naturally a fast beast related to the cheetah and the cats. It's fast to begin with. But then when you put four wings on the back of it, that's super speed. Can you say amen? You see, the lion only had two wings, but the leopard has four wings. And these four wings represent super speed and super conquest was a fit description of Alexander the Great's rapid conquest throughout the then known world. In the short span of about 12 years, they were able to conquer the entire then known world, becoming the superpower of the day. It's none other than the Grecian Empire, friends. The Bible tells us that this leopard, the Grecian Empire, not only had four wings, but it had how many heads? Four heads. Well, what do the four heads represent? Well, friends, you remember history tells us that just two years after taking possession of the whole world, Alexander the Great died. He couldn't conquer him, his own bad habits. He died in a drunken stupor, but he appointed no heir for his throne. And there was not one military leader that was charismatic enough to fill his shoes and his infant son was too young to take the throne and so after alexander the great died the grecian empire was divided into four territories symbolized by the four heads upon the leopard and these four territories were taken by the four generals of, of the alexander the great's army they are known in history as cassander lysimachus ptolemy and seleucus friends it's interesting god said with accuracy with detail what would happen to the empires of history through prophecy before it even happened and history tells us that just as god said it, it it happened exactly as he had said it friends can we trust the bible yes or no absolutely yes it's amazing amen the four heads representing the four uh, uh territories that Gr the grecian empire was divided to uh north south east and west divided by the four generals of alexander's army friends this shows us that god's word is the truth and we can trust him and trust his word tonight. Can you say amen? But what was one of the chief characteristics of the leopard beast, the, the Grecian Empire? Friends, you'll study history, you'll notice that the Greeks were, were known for popularizing pagan philosophy and human reasoning to the entire then known ancient world. They, were, they had the Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and, and many of these philosophers, it, it was, they, they led themselves and, and the people by their own human reasoning. This is one of the chief characteristics of the Grecian Empire. And when you go to Revelation 13 and you describe that, or you talk, we talk about that Antichrist beast kingdom, the composite beast, it looks like a leopard. Why? Because it demonstrates the same human reasoning and philosophies that the Grecian Empire demonstrated. The Antichrist kingdom will teach the same pagan philosophies of Greece. And that's why it looks like a leopard in Revelation chapter 13. History tells us that the Grecian Empire ruled from 331 to 168 BC. After that, the next superpower would come upon the scene, the fourth beast. There, it's described in verse 7 of Daniel chapter 7. Notice with me, Daniel chapter 7, now verse 7. The Bible says, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. It had great what kind of teeth? iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had how many horns so this fourth beast that has iron teeth and ten horns is parallel with the long legs that were made of iron on the image of daniel chapter 2 the beast has iron teeth the image is made of iron it represents the fourth kingdom, representing, or, or that, that is none other than the iron monarchy of Rome. Rome was the kingdom that followed the Grecian Empire. And the Bible tells us that this beast is a terrible beast. And I believe that the, the reason why it's, it, it's somewhat of a nondescript beast, that it's not like a, like, uh, likened to any known animals today, it's a terrible beast, is because the Roman kingdom were masters of cruelty. It was a very terrible kingdom, friends. This was the kingdom that Jesus was born into. You remember when Jesus came into the world? The Roman Empire, the fourth beast, was reigning during that time. 
the Romans destroyed all of their opposition. They were masters of cruelty. And one of the chief characteristics of the Roman Empire, the fourth terrible beast, was not only that they were very cruel, but the Caesars, the emperors, were known for commanding people to worship them. And so the Antichrist beast kingdom in Revelation 13 has the ten horns just like this beast because they demonstrate the same characteristics we're going to see on a future night, that the Antichrist beast power commands people to worship him. Are you with me, yes or no? And so we find that this final superpower of the last day has the same characteristics of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And history tells us that of the four, Rome ruled the longest. From 168 BC to 476 AD. That's when the Roman Empire fell apart. Now, what would happen after the fourth beast? Was there a fifth beast that would reign? Yes or no? No, the Bible says that out of the fourth beast, ten horns rose from it. And friends, these ten horns that are upon the fourth beast, and friends, remind me, what is the fourth beast again? Rome. The fourth beast is Rome. And so from the Roman kingdom arose ten horns, and friends, these ten horns are parallel to the ten toes on the image of Daniel chapter 2. And remember what the ten toes represent? It represents the fact that Rome was not overcome by a fifth empire, but Rome was divided into ten different kingdoms. The Bible even tells us what the ten horns represent. In Daniel 7 verse 24, it says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten what? Kings that shall arise. And so we find, just as the Bible said, history makes clear that Rome was not overcome by a fifth empire, but rather barbarian tribes came from the north, and from different areas and began to conquer different parts of the vast Roman Empire. And just as there are ten toes on the image and ten horns out of the bees, the Roman kingdom was divided into ten. The Alamanni were the modern Germans. The Burgundians were the Swiss. The Franks were the French. The Lombards were the Italians. The Anglo-Saxons were the English. Suevi were the Portuguese. The Visigoths were the Spanish. And then you have the Herli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths, nations that existed back a part of the original ten horns but are no longer in existence today. And we're going to find out why that is this coming Saturday when we talk about Antichrist and, and identifying who the Antichrist is. And so we find that the ten horns representing divided Rome after the fall of the Roman Empire. The Bible tells us that these horns would remain divided from 476 A.D. all the way to the very end of time. And friends, if that's clear, if that makes sense, would you please say amen? amen. Now friends, after describing the breakup of the Roman Empire into ten kingdoms, then Daniel begins to prophesy about the coming kingdom of the Antichrist. It is the same power in Revelation 13, the beast, but in the book of Daniel, God uses a different symbol to represent the Antichrist king. Amongst the ten horns, which represents what again? The ten kingdoms represent which, which kingdoms? Divided Rome. Amongst the ten horns or divided Rome, Daniel sees a little horn rising, a little king. And friends, this little horn power demonstrates the same blasphemous, persecuting power of the composite beast in Revelation 13. Why? Because it's the same kingdom, and we're going to see that even more clearly tonight and on future nights. But I want you to notice what this little horn power will seek to do. It fights not only against the people of God, but it fights against God in heaven through blasphemy. The Bible says in Daniel 7 verse 25, and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall rise after them, and he shall speak what? Great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Here we find this little horn kingdom. It, it seeks to make war against the saints of God, but it also seeks to speak blasphemous words, great words against God himself. This, brothers and sisters, is a kingdom that takes the place of God on earth, claiming to be the judge of the earth, not only making war horizontally, but even making war vertically. It's a kingdom that fights against God and man. It is the great opposer of Christ that sits in the place of God on earth. 
And we don't have the time to identify who it is, but we'll study that later. But I want you to notice the next question. How long would this blasphemous kingdom reign for? And how long would this kingdom pass false judgment on God's people in the earth? Friends, I want you to notice the very next scene that Daniel sees in vision. After he sees the little horn power reigning, the very next thing he sees, notice what happens in verse 9. Right after the little horn is described in verse 8, Daniel then says in verse 9, notice what it says, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne, his what? Throne was the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, and the what was set? The judgment was set, and the books were open. Friends, I want you to notice, immediately after describing the Antichrist little horn power, the scene changes now, and Daniel sees the Ancient of Days, God the Father, sitting upon his fiery throne, and the judgment in heaven beginning. Why is that? Here's the reason. How long will this little horn Antichrist power reign? Until God sets up his judgment until God sits upon his throne and puts this little horn power in its proper place. I want you to notice that this vision about the judgment that takes place around the throne of God happens after the reign of the little horn. In fact, notice with me in verses 21 and 22. The Bible says, I was watching in the, and the same horn was making war with the saints and prevailing against them until, what does that word until mean? It denotes time, isn't that right? So this little horn power would war against the saints and prevail until what? The Ancient of Days came. And what? A judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. So after the reign of the little horn, judgment make it, being made in favor of the saints will begin. In fact, notice another one. In chapter uh, 7, verses 25 through 27, it gets even clearer. The Bible says, talking about that little horn kingdom, the Antichrist power, it says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. But notice the very next thing. But the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it until the end. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Friends, I'm so grateful that the wicked kingdoms of the world are not going to triumph forever. Can you say amen? The Bible tells us that God is going to set up a kingdom. He's going to sit upon his throne in the judgment, and judgment will be made in favor of the saints, the people of God that the little horn kingdom was seeking to destroy and make war against. The main point that I'm trying to bring out is this. I'm trying to show you the sequence of the prophecy, that the great judgment of God follows the reign of the little horn antichrist power. The vision first starts out horizontally. It talks about the lion, bear, leopard, dragon, or the terrible beast and the ten horns and the little horn. It traces Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the Antichrist kingdom, and then the vision now turns vertically where we see God, the Ancient of Days, sitting upon his throne in the judgment. And why is this? Friends, listen carefully. As the little horn kingdom terrorizes the people of God and passes false judgment upon them, and as this little horn kingdom misrepresents God himself by his bold blasphemy, the true judge, God himself, is going to set up his kingdom sitting upon his throne. And in his judgment, he's going to straighten things out. Can you say amen? And what is the purpose of this judgment that follows the reign of the Antichrist? It's twofold. Two reasons. How many? The first one is so that he can vindicate his saints. These people that have been persecuted by the little horn kingdom, God sets up his judgment to vindicate them, to show that these were indeed his people. And the second reason why judgment follows the reign of the Antichrist is because in God's judgment at his throne, he's going to judge the little horn kingdom and destroy it once and for all. Can you say amen? Because this little horn kingdom claimed to be God on earth. It, it, it sat in the place of God on earth. They claimed to be the judge over all the earth. And so now the true judge will put things in its proper place. He's going to straighten things out. And friends, listen, on a later night, we're going we're gonna to learn what all of these mean. All of this means in, in intricate detail. Tonight is more of an overview 
a headshot of, uh, uh, or, or, or um, yes, to, an overview of what, of the sequence of years. That's the main point of tonight's topic. It's so that we can see the sequence of the kingdoms tracing from Babylon to the end of time. And so let's review before we move forward tonight. The sequence of the kingdoms. The first kingdom was the line representing what? Oh, friends, you, you got to help me out tonight. The line represents Babylon. Then the bear representing Medo-Persia. Greece is the next one, and it's symbolized by a leopard. And then after that, a terrible-looking beast with ten horns representing Rome. And then after the Roman Empire, was there a fifth beast? What happened? Ten horns are rising up out of the Roman Empire, representing what? Divided Rome or divided Europe. And then amongst the ten horns, amongst divided Europe, Daniel saw another what kind of horn? little horn rising and that little horn is the antichrist kingdom and immediately after the antichrist kingdom what is the next scene that takes place the judgment of god in heaven so we find babylon medo persia greece rome divided rome then the antichrist kingdom and then god's judgment throne and friends if this is clear so far if you understand this would you please say amen, amen. isn't it exciting by the way Oh, friends, the Word of God is so powerful. Bible prophecy is amazing. It shows us that God is in control of things. Can you say amen? amen? Now, friends, I want you to notice. The judgment throne, who sits upon a throne, by the way? Kings, isn't that right? So when God sits upon this throne, He is not just presiding as judge, but He is presiding as the true king. Saying all these kingdoms, you claim to be superpowers of the world, but I am the true king. He sits upon the throne as judge. And so now that we've gone through Daniel chapter 7 and, and, and traced the sequence of the kingdoms, now we can go to Daniel chapter 8. Because, friends, what God is going to do in Daniel chapter 8 is he's going to repeat and enlarge on what he had just revealed to us in Daniel chapter 7. Friends, listen, the same way Daniel 7 repeats and enlarges on Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 8 repeats and enlarges on Daniel chapter 7. And so God is going to give us more details and so let's notice, this is exciting. Daniel chapter 8. We find Daniel sees two other beasts fighting for supremacy. Notice what it says in Daniel chapter 8 in verse 3. The Bible says, I lifted up mine eyes and saw and behold there stood before the, uh, the river a what? A ram which had how many horns? Two horns. And the two horns were high but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Here, Daniel, in chapter 8, God gives him another vision. And in this vision, he is repeating what he, what he had revealed in Daniel 7, but using different symbols to give more details and to flesh out the prophecy. So Daniel sees a horn that is standing, which, which, is, which simply means that it's a kingdom that's already established. This ram has two horns. But of the two, one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. Oh, friends, what does this mean? We don't have to guess, because the Bible interprets itself. Notice in verse 20, the Bible says that the ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of what? Media and Persia. So this ram with two horns represents the Medo-Persian Empire. It's one beast, one kingdom, but... Two horns because it was two kingdoms that came together in unity to destroy the Babylonians, the Medo-Persian Empire. And it says that one horn was higher than the other, just like the bear was raised up on one side, symbolizing that the Persians were stronger than the Medes. Do you see, friends, how God is repeating and enlarging? Are you with me, yes or no? And so then Daniel sees another beast in chapter 8. In verse 5, this is a goat beast. Notice what it says. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 5, and I, and as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And so now Daniel sees a he-goat. And this goat is not standing. He's not even touching the ground. This goat is moving super fast. It has just one horn between its eyes. And then notice, who is this beast? Verse 21, it says, And the rough goat is the king of who? Grecia. And the great horn, the what kind of horn? It says the great horn that is between his eyes is the what? 
first king and friends what was the first king of greece and no wonder why it says it's a great horn because alexander is called alexander the great and so we find the medo persian empire symbolized by the ram with two horns and then the grecian empire with the one horn that is not touching the ground it is soaring through the through the going so fast and not even touching the ground and then notice what happens these two beasts clash together they're fighting against each other for supremacy and in verse uh in verse six and seven notice what it says and the he goat came to the ram that had two horns and ran unto him in the fury of his power and i saw him come close unto the ram and he was moved with color against him and smote the ram and broke his two horns and then it says and there was no power in the ram to stand before him but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand friends this is a fit description of how the grecian empire destroyed the middle persian empire breaking the two horns on the ram the middle persian empire with the one horn alexander the great conquered the medes and persians and friends i want you to notice what happens next in the vision after the the he goat the grecian empire is established and that first horn alexander the great conquers the persian empire notice what happens to that horn that's on the goat in verse 8 it says therefore the he goat waxed very what great and when he was strong the great horn was broken in other words at the height of his power this great horn broke and for it came up how many notable ones four notable ones toward the four toward the four winds of the heavens friends what does this mean well friends the bible tells us exactly what it means in verse 22 it says now that being broken talking about alexander the great that first horn now that being broken whereas four stood up for it four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation but not in his power in other words that one horn alexander the great that was broken at the height of his power just two years after taking and conquering the middle persian empire he died in a drunken stupor and the four horns came from it it's a symbol and it's parallel with the four heads on the leopard which also represents greece it represents the four generals that divided the vast grecian empire cassandra lysimachus ptolemy and seleucus they rose into the power but they did not have the same power of the first horn that is alexander the great friends it's amazing how god has told us exactly what's going to happen and history confirms that it happened just as god said it can you say amen? amen now friends i don't know about you but i'm excited about that because this shows me tonight that the word of god is true it can be trusted it can be verified friends god is not expecting us to just go blindly and follow whatever he says without using our minds no friends he's given us evidence that we can test to prove that he is the one true god and his word is the truth can you say amen and so we have traced in Daniel chapter 8, Medo-Persia, Greece, the little horn, which, or excuse me, Greece, and that notable horn, the great horn, I should say, which represents Alexander the Great. Then he dies, and then four horns or four heads representing divided Greece into four different territories. Now, friends, tell me, what is the very next kingdom that should follow according to the contextual sequence what should be the next thing that we should see the roman empire isn't that right and friends that's exactly what is seen here in daniel chapter 8 but i want you to notice that god describes the little horn the, the excuse me the, the roman empire a little bit differently than he did in chapter 7. notice how rome is described in daniel 8 verse 9. it says and out of uh, an out of one of them, talking about the four horns, came forth a what? Little horn which waxed exceedingly, exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the what land? The pleasant land. And so here we find, right after the four horns representing divided Greece, the Bible tells us Daniel saw amongst them a little, uh, uh, excuse me, yes, a little horn. And this little horn at first makes war on a horizontal level. He makes war towards the south, toward the east, and towards the pleasant land. Friends, this little horn represents the pagan Roman Empire. The pleasant land in the Bible is none other than Jerusalem, the holy city. It's simply showing that the Roman Empire, the first 
phase of the little horn, the horizontal phase, made war against the people of God. It's fighting on a horizontal level at first. But then that same little horn began to make war against God on a vertical level. Notice what it says in the very next verse, verse 10 through 12. It says, now it turns from horizontally, now it turns vertically. Notice what it says. And it waxed great even to the where? Host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped on them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the who? So here we find the Roman Empire at first making war horizontally. Now they turn vertically, even trying to magnify themselves even to the prince of the host, claiming to be God on earth. And then notice verses 24 and 25. It says, his power shall be mighty and he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper in practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy, he shall cause craft, that's deceit, to prosper in his hand. Here is a kingdom, the Antichrist kingdom, that is causing deception to prosper in the world, trying to destroy the people of God and even fighting against God by his bold blasphemy, magnifying themselves as God on earth. And then it says, and he shall magnify who? Himself. It is a kingdom filled with pride, magnifying and glorifying themselves in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. And he shall stand up against who? The prince of princes. Here is the little horn antichrist power, friends, that is a continuation of Rome, that acts as judge on the earth, that commands the worship that belongs to God alone, persecuting the saints and even trying to make war with God and the truth of God. And friends, question, or excuse me, as Daniel sees this little horn kingdom the antichrist he is troubled by what this kingdom is going to do and so he begins to inquire and think how long will this little horn power reign for i mean how long is it how long is god going to put up with this kingdom verse 13 the angels asked the question to each other then i heard a holy one speaking and here's the question how long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, giving the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. In other words, Dan, the, the, the question is asked, how long is this little horn power that is trampling upon the sanctuary, trampling upon the truth of God, trampling upon the people of God, how long is it going to reign for? How long will God put up with this terrible kingdom that is blaspheming against God and seeking to destroy the people of God. How long will the Antichrist kingdom reign? Well, friends, according to the context of what we study, what should be the very next thing that we should see after the reign of the little horn? What is the very next thing Daniel should see according to the secrets? Well, what did he see in chapter 7? Do you remember? After the reign of the little horn, what was the very next scene or vision he saw? He saw judgment where? At the throne of of God in heaven and so we should anticipate as the question is asked how long is is the sanctuary and the truth of God and the people of God going to be trampled underfoot by this little horn kingdom how long will it be we should anticipate the very next thing we should see in chapter 8 is what the judgment because what is God doing he is repeating and enlarging and so I want you to notice how the answer how the question is answered in the very next verse, Daniel 8 and verse 14. God gives us a time prophecy to answer the question of how long will this little horn antichrist kingdom continue to destroy the people and the truth of God? The Bible says in verse 14, here's the answer, folks. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 what? Days. Then shall the what? Sanctuary be cleanse i want us to notice that in this passage god uses a different word to describe the judgment of the little horn he said after 2300 days then the sanctuary that was trampled underfoot by the little horn that the little horn sought to make war against and destroy it says then the sanctuary would be cleansed and friends that word cleansed in the hebrew language it literally means restored what does it mean 
and friends, something needs to be restored. Why? Because it was broken or trampled upon. Is that right? So during the reign of the little horn, Antichrist kingdom, the sanctuary and the message of God and, and the one that sits there in the sanctuary, God himself was trampled upon by this bold blasphemous power. But God says, oh, don't you worry. This little horn is not going to reign forever. After 2,300 days, this sanctuary is going to be restored. It's going to be cleansed. Or another word in the Hebrew, it will be vindicated. It will be what? And friends, that word vindicated is a judgment expression. God gives a time prophecy to answer the question as to when God will judge the little horn power and when the truth of his sanctuary is going to be restored and vindicated. And friends, listen, in mentioning the cleansing of the sanctuary, God is simply enlarging upon judgment. Here is a chart so that we can visualize the repeat and enlarge principle to see that the sanctuary being cleansed and the judgment of God is synonymous, it's connected, it's the same thing. And we're going to find that more clearly at 7 o'clock, but notice this chart. Here are the different superpowers of prophecy. Here we find Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, and Daniel chapter 8 repeating and enlarging upon the same things using different symbols. In Daniel chapter 2, the symbol was gold, silver, brass, iron, ten toes, representing Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome, and divided Rome. And then in Daniel 7, there are four beasts. Do you see it? The first was the lion. That's Babylon. Then the bear, Medo-Persia. Then the leopard, which is Greece. Then the terrible beast, which is Rome. And then out of that, ten horns representing divided Rome. And then amongst the ten horns, the little horn kingdom. And then the very next thing is judgment. But now as we go to Daniel chapter 8, the ram and goat vision, we find that the kingdom of Babylon is not mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. Do you know why? Because by the time Daniel has this vision, the Babylonian kingdom is almost finished. And God is not so much concerned with the things of the past, but the things of the future. Can you say amen? amen. And so you can leave your past and let it be past and move forward in the future. Amen? amen. And so the Babylonian kingdom is not mentioned in chapter 8. But the, the ram is representing Middle Persia with the two horns. Then the goat with the one notable horn representing Greece and Alexander the Great. And then after that, the four horns representing divided Greece into four kingdoms. And then after the, the, the he-goat is described, then in chapter 8, Daniel sees the little horn, but first the horizontal phase of the little horn representing Rome and how Rome would attack horizontally the different kingdoms of the world. But then that same power from attacking horizontally would then turn vertically and attack the people of God, the truth of God, and the sanctuary of God. And then immediately after describing the vertical phase of the little horn antichrist kingdom, the very next thing God describes is the cleansing of the sanctuary. Now, friends, listen. Daniel 7 talked about the throne judgment after the little horn. But Daniel 8 talks about the cleansing of the sanctuary after the little horn reign. Why? Because the throne judgment and the cleansing of the sanctuary are talking about the same event. God is repeating and enlarging. Are you with me, yes or no? Now here's the next question. How do we know that the cleansing of the sanctuary is referring to judgment? In other words, what does the sanctuary have to do with judgment? Oh, friends, remember, where does judgment begin? Or where does judgment take place? At the what? The throne of of God. But friends, do you know where God's throne is? It's in the sanctuary. Notice what it says in Jeremiah 17 verse 12. It says, a glorious high what? Throne. From the beginning is the place of his sanctuary. And that's the reason why God talked about the sanctuary in referring to judgment because judgment takes place at the throne. And where's the throne? It's none other than in the sanctuary of God. This is the place, brothers and sisters that God will preside as judge over the little horn. And this is the place where he will pass judgment in favor of the saints. In other words, God is wanting to encourage us that as we see the superpowers of the past and the Antichrist kingdom working havoc against God and the people of God, that we do not need to be afraid because God is going to sit upon the throne in judgment that is found in the sanctuary. And friends, remember we talked about the sanctuary last night. 
What does that word sanctuary mean? It's a place of safety and refuge. Can you say amen? In other words, we don't have to be afraid. God has a sanctuary for us. In fact, notice in Psalms 20, verses 1 and 2, write it down. Psalms 20, verse 1 and 2 says, May the Lord answer you in the what kind of day? Friends, when we're in trouble, we pray to God, God's going to answer us. But notice where he will answer us from. It says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob do what? Defend you. Friends, that word defend is a judgment expression. Can you say amen? A lawyer that defends someone that has been attacked and accused falsely. It says, may the name of the Lord, of the God of Jacob defend you, and may he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. You see, after the reign of the little horn, God talks about the sanctuary being cleansed, being restored, being vindicated, assuring God's people that we don't have to be afraid of the attacks of the Antichrist because God has a place he's going to send help from the sanctuary. But here's the question, friends, as we go a little bit deeper tonight and start bringing out a few last points. How does the sanctuary help us from the troubling Antichrist kingdom in the last days? How is this sanctuary? Because you see, most Christian churches say, oh, that sanctuary, that's the Old Testament, that's not relevant. But friends, let me tell you, the only way you can understand the New Testament and Revelation is to understand what these symbols represent. Now, we don't have to slay lambs or anything like that, but friends, we have to understand its significance because let me tell you, the gospel of the New Testament, the very foundation of it is the sanctuary because these were prophecies pointing forward to, the, to Jesus Christ and what he would do for us in salvation. Can you say amen? And so how does this sanctuary help us in the day of trouble from the troubling Antichrist kingdom I want us to notice as we take a look at the psalmist prayer that shed some light on just how the sanctuary helps us to overcome the Antichrist. In Psalms 73 and verse 2 through verse 7. Psalms 73 verse 2 through verse 7. Please write it down. The Bible says, I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of who? So here is the psalmist, God's child envious that the wicked are prospering he can't understand it and then he describes the prosperity of the wicked and he says for there are no pangs in their death but their strength is firm how could this be they're wicked and yet they're strong they are not in trouble as other men nor are they plagued like other men the psalmist is baffled by this and then he says Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with what? Abundance. They have more than the heart could wish. The psalmist is thinking about the wicked and how they're prospering, and he's baffled. Why is this? They have abundance. They're prospering. How could this be? And friends, when we study about this little horn kingdom and how they prospered for so long, the question comes to us, how could this be? The psalmist is wondering, how long will the wicked prosper? How long will they triumph seemingly over the righteous people of God? How long will it be? Then notice what the psalmist says. Verses 16 through 19 of the same chapter. It says, when I thought to understand this, understand what? Understand how the wicked could prosper. Understand how that little horn antichrist kingdom could reign for so long and destroy God's people. When I sought to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their end. Amen? That's why immediately after talking about the reign of the little horn, God points us to the sanctuary. Because when you go and study that sanctuary topic, it helps us to understand that the wicked are not going to reign forever, that the Antichrist kingdom will come to an end. It will be made desolate. It continues to say, surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation, as in a moment they are utterly consumed with terrors. In other words, brothers and sisters, the true judge is going to destroy the earthly superpowers and the Antichrist kingdom in these last days. And so you don't have to be afraid, friends. Amen? 
This is why, brothers and sisters, the study of prophecy is not scary. It's a revelation of hope. It gives us confidence. It dispels all fear from our lives because it shows us that God's kingdom is going to reign. Can you say amen? And the question is, have you decided to become a citizen of that eternal kingdom? Have you aligned yourselves with the kingdom of Christ? The Bible says the psalmist, when he went into the sanctuary, then he understood. In other words, there's something about the sanctuary that, that helps us to understand Bible prophecy, to understand why our world is the way it is. And friends, I believe that that is the exact reason why Satan has worked so hard to cause people to ignore the sanctuary. To say, oh, it's not really, that's the Old Testament. Oh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. But friends, God wants us to look into this. Everything that God says is irrelevant. Can you say amen? God does not waste words. But it's interesting that many sincere, wonderful people in the Christian world, they, they, they say, oh, they ignore it. But in reality, it, it helps us to understand why things are the way they are. And how God is going to conquer evil in the end. Because friends, listen, this in the sanctuary, this is where the true judge will set up his throne in judgment. Here in the sanctuary is where the true king and the true kingdom would reign. It is here in the sanctuary that God will execute his righteous judgments upon the little horn. It's here in the sanctuary that he will provide a refuge, a sanctuary for his persecuted people. And friends, when you think about the sanctuary, what is the central object in the sanctuary? The central character in the sanctuary is the lamb, friends. The lamb that was slain. That's the central figure in the sanctuary. Everything that happened in the sanctuary revolved around the lamb that was slain. And friends, the sanctuary teaches us about the power of this lamb to overcome all the other beasts and kingdoms of the world. And this is important because Revelation reveals this reality. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 6, the Bible says, I beheld and lo, in the midst of the what? And friends, where's the throne? In the sanctuary. It says, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain in the sanctuary, in the throne. We see a lamb that has been slain. This is the power of Jesus triumphing over evil and over sin. You see, brothers and sisters, the slain lamb, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross was a death nail to, to Satan's antichrist kingdom. Can you say amen? And that's the reason why the beast hates the lamb. That's why the Antichrist kingdom is seeking to destroy the lamb and the followers of the lamb. And friends, Revelation describes the beast's final attempt to dethrone the lamb in these last days. I want to read it to you, and we're going to find out exactly what it means later. But here's foundation, friends. Notice Satan's final attempt through the Antichrist beast to try to destroy the Lamb and the kingdom of God. It's found in Revelation 17, verse 12. Notice what it says. Revelation 17, 12. It says, And the ten horns which you saw are, are ten, what? Kings, which have received no, what? Kingdom as yet. I want you to notice, what is this talking about? Ten horns are ten kings. Do you remember out of the fourth beast, the Roman Empire rose how many horns? And what do those ten horns represent? Ten kings, but more specifically, it represents divided Rome or the breakup of Rome, divided Europe. Tell me, friends, is Europe still divided tonight, yes or no? Yes. And so it says, which have received no kingdom. That word kingdom, is it in the singular or in the plural? Singular. In other words, ten kings, plural, will not receive one kingdom. Do you know why? Because they will not adhere or cleave one to another even as iron is not mixed with clay. Do you remember that? In other words, in other words Europe is going to remain divided to the very end of time. Ten kings, but they don't have one kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. In other words, they're going to try to unite. The divided kingdoms of the world are going to try to come together, but they're not going to come together in a one-world government. 
That's not going to happen, friends, because they will not cleave or mix together. But there is going to be a unity. They're going to reign as kings one hour with the beast. And then it says, these have one what? In other words, how are they one? Not in a one world government. They have one mind. In other words, they are on the same page in their mindset in these last days, in their goals and ideology. You see, to have one mind means to have one intention, one resolve, one purpose. They're going to come together, not so much be one world government, but they're going to unite and have the same goal in all the world. And what will this unity result in? It continues. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the... So what's going to happen as a result of this unity? They're going to look to the beast, the Antichrist kingdom, as the leader in the last days. They're going to lend their power, their influence to the beast. And that's the reason why that this Antichrist beast is the final superpower of the world. It not only has all the characteristics of all the other superpowers of the past, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and Rome, and not only has all of those characteristics, but it has all the power and influence and support of the ten horns. Here is a super beast, friends, a superpower, the Antichrist kingdom. And friends, notice what happens. Notice what the unity will result in. It says, these shall make war with who? The Lamb. In other words, the divided kingdoms of the world will give their power and support to the final Antichrist beast kingdom. And as a result of this unity, they're going to make war with the Lamb. They're going to try to destroy the people of God, the truth of God, and even God himself. They will make war with the Lamb. Friends, when you look at this, it seems like an unfair match. How in the world can a lamb, which is a humble, meek animal, how can a lamb stand up against a lion? How can a lamb stand up against a bear or a leopard or a terrible beast? How can the lamb, it seems like the lamb doesn't have a chance. The future seems so bleak. Is there any hope? Who's going to win this war? Who's going to overcome? They're going to make war with the lamb. But the Bible says that the lamb shall overcome them. Amen? The lamb will overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Oh, brothers and sisters, this lamb has the power to slay beasts. This lamb is going to overcome the dragon kingdoms of the last days. He is the rightful Lord, the rightful king, and the rightful judge. Bible prophecy tells us clearly that the lamb kingdom is going to remain victorious against the beast kingdoms and the final superpowers of the world. Can you say amen? And friends, listen, as the lamb takes his rightful place, upon the throne in his sanctuary, those who follow the Lamb with us wherever he goes, those who keep their eyes fixed on Jesus, those who are with him, the Bible says, notice, those who are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This is what I like to call victory by association. Victory by what? You see, those that are with him are not the ones fighting the beast because they don't stand a chance. Who is the one that overcomes? It says the Lamb shall overcome. And as long as we associate ourselves with the Lamb, as long as we follow the Lamb, the Lamb is going to win the victory, and because He wins, we will win as well. Can you say amen? It's just like those who are big fans of a certain basketball team. And whenever that basketball team wins, they feel like they won when they didn't step foot on the court. They didn't score one point. They didn't get one rebound. And yet they feel like they won. Why? Because they associate themselves with that team in the same way, friends, when we place ourselves in line with the Lamb of God, His kingdom, the truth, Jesus Christ, it says that we're going to win the victory as well. Can you say amen? Oh, friends, you don't have to worry about the beast. Just stay close to the Lamb. And friends, in the sanctuary, as the lamb sits upon the throne, that is the place, listen carefully, that is the place where he makes those who are called 
and those who are chosen, He also makes them faithful. Amen? In other words, He makes us faithful by giving to us His faithfulness. Where does the faithfulness of God come from? It comes from the sanctuary at the throne in judgment. Amen? This is beautiful, folks. And when the Lamb makes us faithful by us following Him wherever He leads, it's then that we'll be able to find, that sing that final victory song. Two more verses, then we're finished. Revelation 5, 13 says, And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and such that are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor, read it with me, and glory and power, be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And then it says in chapter 11, verse 15, and the kingdoms of this world, the superpowers of prophecy, are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. How many want to be a part of that everlasting Lamb kingdom? Friends, that is the true superpower of prophecy. Not the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon, the beast, but the lamb. I want to be a part of that kingdom. How about you? If so, I invite you to bow your heads with me as we close with prayer, shall we? Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word that is so exciting, Lord. We see that Bible prophecy is not something to be afraid of at all. Even though the beast kingdoms and the superpowers of the world have, have wrought havoc against you and your people, we thank you, Lord, that you have and will win the final victory. And tonight, Lord, we want to give you our hearts. We want to be a part of the Lamb kingdom, the kingdom that will reign forever. And so would you please, Lord, teach us what it means to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Teach us what it means to abide in the sanctuary that you have set up for us, that place of refuge, that place of safety, security, satisfaction, and salvation. Help us, Lord, to stop going in and out, but help us to abide as you abide in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.